Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a good Saturday. I know for you it might be Saturday evening or it might be Saturday night. For me, it is Saturday morning. We'll get this lesson started in about 22 seconds, it looks like. I'm just doing a little check of the audio. It sounds like everything's great and we can start in about 10 seconds. I'm pretty excited. I think this will be a nice lesson for all of you. Um, and I hope that you enjoy it. Starting in one second, I guess. Whoa, I clicked the wrong button. As you can see, I do have the camera set up pointing at the river. I know that last week, I think someone came by in a canoe and I missed it. I didn't switch to the river cam during that moment of last Saturday. So hopefully this time, if I see something in the river, I'll try to pay attention. I'll switch to the river cam and you'll be able to hopefully see someone going by. For those of you that are new here, let me explain what I am doing. This is a live English lesson. I am live outside here on my farm in Ontario, Canada. Today, I will try to answer some questions. The questions will come from all of you. There will be a link to a form. It's in the description below. It's also shared in the chat. You can use that link to ask a question. And then I will try to answer that question. I will answer it by trying to, I will put it on the screen here and then I'll do my best to answer it. I generally like questions that are quick and easy to answer. Sometimes the longer explanations take too long and it's better for me to just make a video about it. But anyways, if you do have a question, please use the link that will be shared by either Dave or Brad. So Todd is not here today. I was mistaken yesterday. Todd has to work today as well. So we have Brad back again and then of course Dave who you are all familiar with. So please um, keep the chat civil, keep the chat a happy place. Please use it to practice English conversations with each other uh, and I will I think get started on this lesson. I should say hi to a few people though. Um, hi to Maria C. Hi to Mode Ags. Hi to of course Brad and Dave the Canadian. Hi to Brent from American English with this guy who's driving, so he's listening in, so he can't say hi in the chat necessarily. Uh, hi to Rod, I see in the chat as well. Ario is in the chat. James, I'm just scrolling back. Meza Fernandez is in the chat as well. Diego is in the chat. Snazzy is in the chat. Um, I'm sorry, I think Talk Italian with Arone is in the chat as well. Hello to everybody. Hello to Aniko Abiro who's in the chat. So many familiar names, but we're not here for me to say hi to everybody. Although it is really nice when I do have a chance to say hi, we're actually here to answer some questions. So let me do an audio check. And it sounds like everything's working great. So let me pull up the first question. Let me get the questions on the screen. I know last week um, I got through a lot of them, but sometimes it's hard to get through all of them. Uh, let me see here. Um, let's go with the first question here is from Tripto. And Tripto says, hello, Mr. Bob. Hello, Tripto. Why interaction is so important? Number two, interaction this way or interaction through speaking? Which one is better? Thank you for your dedication. So in the English learning world, there are many theories about what helps you learn English the fastest. In my opinion, it's really good to make sure you're having English conversations every week. Even at the beginner level, I think it's really important. Some people will say that you must just have a lot of input. I think that's a good idea. But I think interaction in any way is important as long as it's meaningful interaction. So when you ask me a question and I answer it, we have a bit of a connection as people. So it's meaningful interaction. If you leave a comment on one of my videos, I try to answer as many as I can. It's a little bit of interaction and it makes you happy because you interacted with someone. It makes me happy. As humans, we like to interact. So I would say the best kind of interaction, uh, Tripto, is any kind of interaction, whether it's a conversation on Skype, whether it's in a comment on a YouTube video or just watching a live stream and asking a question, it's all super important and very, very helpful for your journey, um, that, for the journey you're on of learning English. Next question is from Alex Valdez. Hi, Prof Bob. 
Is there any differences between scared and frightened? Have a nice day. Um, you are awesome. Uh, not really. I'm scared of dogs. I'm frightened of dogs. We usually say I'm scared of or I'm afraid of. Those I think are the two most common things. By the way, as most of you know, I did a lesson yesterday on fears. Uh, you can go watch that lesson later if you want or there's a shortened version coming out tomorrow that you could watch. Uh, and Alex is asking a question about that related to that topic. So, I would say, um, you know, I'm frightened of dogs. I'm afraid of dogs. It's more common to say I'm afraid or I'm scared of. Those would be more common. Um, let's go to the next question here. Uh, let's see here. Eduardo has the next question. Hey, Bob. Good morning. Good morning, Eduardo. I dread the first day of school. I, I am scared of the first day of school. You've got to settle down. You need to calm down, which is correct. So, I made corrections while I was reading them. Let me read them again. I dread the first day of school. I'm scared on the first day of school or I'm scared of the first day of school. You could say, say both. Um, you've got to settle down. That's something you would say to someone uh, or you need to calm down. Uh, that's how I would say those and those would be the correct forms. Um, let's see here. Next question from Natalie. Hi, teacher Bob, please. What is the difference between these words? Thank you, anticipate, expect, acknowledge, and admit. So, when you anticipate something, it means you think it's probably going to happen. I anticipate that we'll have about four to five hundred people watching this live stream today. Um, I'm expecting that as well. So, I'm using um, anticipate and expect as in the same way. I expect there will be about 400 to 500 people here, maybe as high as 600. Um, when you acknowledge something, it means you notice it or you recognize it. Sometimes people will acknowledge a message by replying to you. Like, could you just reply and so that I know that you are acknowledging this message? Uh, and then when you admit something, uh, you simply say that it did happen. Um, sometimes when you do something bad as a child, your parents want to admit that you did something wrong. Uh, let's see here. Next question from S.L. Lenka. Hi, teacher Bob. They should have been here by now. What's the meaning of shoulda? Some native speakers say shoulda equals should of. Is it should have? Thank you. So, they should have been here by now. They should have been here by now. So, I'm not sure of the exact grammatical um, uh, description. I'm losing my words here. I'm not sure of the exact rule, but I will tell you this. Shoulda is definitely a short form of should of and should have. I think probably it's a short form of should have, but I'm out of my depth here. I don't actually know the answer. What I do know is that we do definitely say shoulda and we do definitely say sentences like, they should have been here by now. They should have been here by now. They should have. I think it's a short form of should have in that case. Um, I should have gone to the store yesterday and bought hot dog buns. I should have. Yes, I think that's it. I'm gonna have to look that one up and give you a better explanation. Please leave a comment in the question. Uh, and for those of you who are curious, I'll try to answer it later today or tomorrow. Um, Yaroslav, hi, teacher Bob. What grammatical category the phrase peace should not have to be bought belongs to? Th help, please take care. I'm not sure of the exact grammatical category, but the sentence simply means that if you want peace, you should work towards peace in a way where everyone is happy. You shouldn't just pay a lot of people to not complain. Um, if you get peace in your family by simply buying your kids toys and treats, um, then they definitely, it's not real peace then, right? You've bought that peace. Um, so, I would need to look up though what the exact grammatical category is. So, sorry I don't have that answer for you. Wow, two in a row where I didn't have a great answer but I think they still made for good listening practice at least. Next question is from Aya. How can I improve my pronunciation? I'm going to correct it there instead of the. How can I improve pronunciation? Or how can I improve my pronunciation? I'm Japanese and they have a strong accent. Um, I think one of the things is, is the more you speak and the more you exaggerate the sounds when you're speaking by yourself, the better it can be for you. So, what I mean by that is if you're having trouble saying a word like the because the th is hard, just when you're by yourself, try to over pronounce it like the. 
Sorry, that probably sounded funny. The, like really pronounce it hard and then try to soften it. So instead of trying to pronounce it perfectly, try to overpronounce it. I find in French when I overpronounce words, if I'm practicing by myself, then I can soften it later um, and it helps quite a bit. Hey, let me go to uh, Riverview and let me do just a quick audio check here. Sounds like everything's working. I, I put a bench over there for all of you, by the way, so that when we go to River Cam View, uh, you can pretend that you're sitting on the bench uh, watching the water go by. Um, let's see here. Next question. I like this question. Uh, let me get it on the screen here. Uh, Abu Bakar says, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm having a good day. I must admit, I'm... The answers to your questions aren't coming as quickly as they normally do. I did have a good night's sleep, but I think I just have a lot on my mind right now. So hopefully from now on, the questions or the answers get a little bit better. We'll see. For me, it's just sometimes fun to hang out and answer questions um, and to see people chatting. So hopefully I'm making sense today. Uh, let's see. Next question from Irina. Hi, Bob. Is their taking part the same as their participation? Which variant would you choose on a daily basis? Thank you. So I added a word there, daily basis. So when you're taking part in something, when they're taking part in something, yeah. So like, let's say I was going to um, a festival. No, let's say I'm going to a sports competition. I'm going to take part in the sports competition. I would say uh, that means I'm going to play. Okay, I'm going to take part or I'm going to participate. I would use both. I think they are used almost equally. So when you're going to take part in something, it means that you're going to participate. They would mean the same. Yes. From Yin, what is the best entertainment show movie to learn the Canadian accent in English? So there is a television channel called CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and they make Canadian television shows. So I would go to the cbc.ca website and on that website, you can probably find a list of all of the current uh, Canadian television shows that are popular. Uh, and then I would just choose from some of those. And then you would definitely hear the Canadian accent. Let's see here. Next question from Yusuf. Hello, Bob. I love you. Well, thank you. I want to thank you. You are the best. Thank you very much. I have one question. Tell me the difference between two people and with people. So when you give something to people, like if I was to give this water to people, it means I'm handing it to them. If I was to do something with people, it means we're all doing the same thing. Let's use the example of a sport. If I was playing a sport and there were other people on my team, I would be playing a sport with people. That would be the difference. Um, next question from Daniel. Why you don't use to cook in the next sentence? My aunt made me help her cook for the festival. Shouldn't it be to? No, it definitely does not have a two in it. You are, your sentence is correct. My aunt made me help her cook for the festival. Um, and if you, if you said to cook, it wouldn't sound, uh, yeah, it would sound a little off. My aunt made me help her cook. So I don't know the exact reason why, but you definitely wouldn't have to cook. Um, she made me help her cook for the festival. That is correct. That is the right way to write it. And again, I don't know exactly why. The grammatical side of Bob's brain isn't running at full speed today. <laughs> Next question from Natalia. Hi, Mr. Bob. Can you explain to me Little correction, why sometimes either is pronounced as E, like Brie, like B, and others I, like bite. So either you say it as either or you say it as either. Um, I say it both ways. I'm not sure if that's because there's an American and a British pronunciation. Canadians often have, for some words, we have more than one pronunciation because we live very close to the United States, but we are also originally a British colony. So sometimes we just have two pronunciations. So we say either and either. So I'm not sure, except that I say both and people don't really notice. They don't say, ho ho, you just said either instead of either. It just sounds normal to everybody. 
Bitter has the next question. Hello, how can I improve my English listening? So this is one of the easiest things to improve because there are so many things you can listen to. So number one, there are lots of videos on YouTube that you can watch and listen to. Number two, it's very enjoyable to listen to English music. So do that. Listen to as much English music as you possibly can. The other thing you can do is if you're reading a book, listen to the audio version of the book as well. So maybe listen while you read, close the book and listen to the next chapter. So listening is to, in my mind, one of the easiest things to practice because there is so much listening material available to you out there. Hey, I do want to pause and go to the river cam. Uh, I just want to pause to say to everyone, there is a red subscribe button there. If you have not subscribed in the past, um, I think you would be happy if you subscribed. Um, if you subscribe, uh, you get notified when I do a new English lesson. Um, and I'm just going to move the mic here because I feel like my camera was getting a little dark. I usually have to figure out how to adjust my camera using my phone. I haven't connected those two yet. There, now you can see me a little better. The sun went away and I don't have my camera set on automatic. So now it's a little easier to see me. Hey, anyways, if you are new here, please consider subscribing. Um, I do an English lesson every Tuesday uh, and a live lesson every Friday. This was yesterday's live lesson on fear. Um, and I do this live question and answer lesson on Saturdays, and it's a lot of fun. Let me get to the next question here. Margo says, hi, Mr. Bob, what's your favorite old fashioned English word or proverb? Best wishes from Ukraine. So I do like in Canada, we sometimes actually rarely call a couch, a Chesterfield. It's one of those older words that a lot of people think Canadians call their couch a Chesterfield. And I think 50 years ago they did, but I find it kind of a funny and unique Canadian English word. So Chesterfield used to be a word we used a lot for couch. We don't anymore. We just say couch. Sometimes we say sofa. And then proverb. Um, what's the best proverb uh, that I can think of English proverb? Um, don't put the cart before the horse. That's a good one, which means don't do things in the wrong order. That's what that one means. I like that proverb. Um, next question from Charlotte. How for those who don't have any audience to practice language? So I think Charlotte's question is this. How do I practice my English if I don't have someone to talk to? How do I practice a language if I'm learning a language? How do I practice it if I don't have someone to talk to? So my simple answer is always this hire somebody. Okay. It's easy to read and write and listen to English without having a partner. Writing is a little challenging. You might want someone to, to look at your writing. Um, but definitely, um, I would say speaking is something where sometimes you just have to hire someone. If you don't have the money, look for someone who wants to learn your language and do a language exchange. So if you speak a language that people in the world want to learn, that English speakers want to learn. Try to find someone who you can do a language exchange with, with. That's what I would say. And then all of the other things like speak out loud as often as you can. Sing along to songs as often as you can. Um, just a very good thing to do. Uh, let's see here. Katerina from Ukraine. Sunny Saturday dinner. Dear teacher Bob, could you tell me some new words? How do you say I cut the grass? We say, um, I need to mow the lawn. I need to cut the grass. Uh, I need to clip the grass maybe, but usually it's cut or mow. Those are the two common ones. I need to get my lawnmower out. I need to get my lawnmower started and I need to mow the lawn or I need to cut the grass. Those are the two that we would say. You could say cut the lawn or mow the grass, but I think we almost always say mow the lawn or cut the grass. Next question from Eduardo. Hi, Eduardo. How can I use the word wonder, wondering? Is it a synonym of think? Thank you for your answer. Yes. Hmm. I wonder how I can answer this one. Basically what I'm saying is, or I could say, I'm wondering how I could answer this one. So it basically is a way to say that you th you're thinking of an answer. Like, I wonder 
what Jen is doing right now. I know she's actually in the house making something. Uh, I think she's baking brownies actually. But when you say, I wonder, it means you're thinking about um, or trying to figure out what is happening. Let's see here. Next question from W.A. Cavish. Hi, Bob. Today, can you elucidate the meaning of the word stint as both a noun and verb and the phrasal verb mow down? Thank you in advance from Sri Lanka. So when you do a stint somewhere, so I'm going to describe it as a noun because that's the most common. You could say, oh, you know, when I was younger, I did a stint as a chef in a restaurant. When I was a kid, um, I no, not a kid. When I was a teenager, I, I worked a stint as a busboy at a restaurant. So it means a period of time, okay? Um, and then as a verb, I have not used it as a verb, okay? So I would use it as a noun referring to a period of time when I was doing something. Uh, and then to mow down, this is not a nice phrasal verb. It usually refers to... Um, like if you watch a war movie and someone has a machine gun, they might be, they might mow down the enemies with the machine gun. So kind of a horrible thing to picture in your mind, but that's what that verb would be used for mostly. Let's see here. Francesco, hi teacher. How can I write a good essay? It does exist. Does there exist a method? Thanks. P.S. Did you receive my postcard from the Valley of the Temples? Big bye, teacher. I haven't been to my post office box in like four weeks, Francesco, so I will check. I'm sure it's waiting for me there. How do you write a good essay? The simple way to write a good essay, make sure you have an introduction. Make sure you clearly explain three things or three parts of your argument and then have a really good conclusion. Is there a method? Yes, it's the same for every language and I think it's going to take me a little bit too long if I was to try and to explain it here. So, but definitely uh, write clearly and succinctly and kind of explain things as best as you can. Uh, let's see here. Note of Cash says, hello, Mr. Bob. Question number one, why do you like to learn more English? Question two, what are the, what is paraphrasing? You're nice, thanks. So a little correction in there. Um, Question number one, why do you like to learn more English? I'm not sure if you're asking me that question or maybe you're asking why I like to teach English. For myself personally, I just always like to learn new things. So learning new things about my own language and the French language are exciting for me. Paraphrasing is simply when you condense a piece of writing or you say something in less words. So if you see a whole paragraph and you want to say it in just one sentence, you would paraphrase, you would summarize, you would create a small summary of it. Next question from Betty. Betty says, hi, Bob. What's the difference between these two? Instantly and immediately. Reduce and decline. Thanks a lot for the explanation. Well, let's use each of those in a sentence. He appeared instantly. That means that, you know, when I mentioned Joe's name, he appeared instantly. So he wasn't there. And then as soon as I said his name, he was there. If I said he appeared immediately, it would be very similar. I think instantly um, kind of communicates even more speed. But if I said Joe showed up immediately, that would still mean he showed up pretty quickly, but maybe a little slower than instantly. When you reduce something, so we are trying to reduce the amount of garbage that we put in our garbage dumps. We are trying to reduce the amount uh, and we do that by recycling. And then decline is when you say something like, you know, the amount of people who smoke in Canada is declining. It's on uh, the decline. Okay, so it's going down. I used it kind of as a verb and a noun there. Um, let's see here. Judith has a question. Hi, Bob. What kind of fear is pteridophobia? I hope you will play GeoGuessr on Monday. How are you and your sons? I'm good. My kids are good. Um, I do not know. Just one second here. I think I messed something up. No, I didn't. I do not know what that is, but I'm going to look it up real quick. So why don't I switch to Riverview and let me find the question. Let's see here, Judith. I'm going to use Google as my brain for a second. And I'm going to look up that word. Um, the fear of ferns. So that is, in Judith's question, a fear of a plant that we call a fern. I didn't know there was a fear of those. I think I got that right. Let me double check. Pteridophobia. 
is the fear of ferns, which is a type of plant that is often used in food. There you go. Now we know. Thanks, Judith. Let's see here. Dimitri, when I first got on your channel, I didn't understand much. After a year, I completely understand everything. Ten years of studying English at school was a waste of time. Well, I'm not sure I agree that the ten years was a waste of time. Let's look at it this way instead. It was certainly kind of a base. You had a base level of knowledge. Maybe you didn't learn a lot during those 10 years, but you certainly had some knowledge of the English language, which maybe helped you understand me a bit. But I would say that if you've watched a lot of my videos and other YouTube videos over the last year, that probably has helped you quite a bit. Um, not just me, but everything that you've done uh, to learn English. Mode. Hi, Mr. Bob. You said you like easy questions, so here's one. Do you like chewing gum? Are you afraid of people who chew gum loudly? Sorry, easy questions are sometimes silly. Well, it's not really a silly question. I don't like people who chew gum with their mouth open. So if people chew gum like that, it doesn't bother me. If people chew gum like this and I can hear it, yeah, that bothers me a bit. Do I like chewing gum? When I was in university, um, I actually was a gum chewer. I chewed gum almost every day. Um, I really liked chewing gum, but eventually I quit because I, I didn't want to buy gum anymore. It was a little bit expensive. Let's see here. Next question from Amal. I want to ask you from where I start my journey to improve my English. Could we have a plane to achieve this? I am a new student in your channel. Thank you. So you wrote plane, but you meant plan. And yes, there is a plan. I'm going to ask if Dave... The Canadian can find the video called the best way to learn English in my opinion. So I made a video, um, let's see, probably a year and a half ago. Uh, and it's called the best way to learn English in my opinion. Uh, and it kind of gives you a plan for how to structure your week to study English. So if Dave, the Canadian could find that or Brad, uh, Dave will probably find it quicker. Cause I think Brad's not used to me asking uh, him to do uh, things like that yet. Let's see here. Next question from Eugene from Etobicoke. Hi, Eugene. When I look towards the north, Etobicoke is like an hour and a bit that way. It looks sunny. I think Eugene's having a sunny day and I here on the farm am having a slightly cloudy day. Anyways, Eugene's question. Ontario is home to some of the best locations and attractions in North America. We have Muskoka, Algonquin and Niagara Falls. We can have a romantic getaway this summer. It is a beautiful place to live. I will not deny it. Um, it is so much fun uh, choosing where to go on the weekends when we have time. We have seen all of the places that you mentioned at some point in our lives. Our kids haven't, um, but I have actually camped in Algonquin Park. It is beautiful up there. Very peaceful and very, very quiet. Uh, let's see here. Heinrich says, so my question is, is it possible to say he mustn't be a soccer player instead of he can't be a soccer player? I think mustn't is wrong. So they have slightly different meanings. If I said um, he, has, he has a bad leg, he mustn't play soccer. What I'm saying is that because his leg is bad, if he plays soccer, it will get hurt more. So I'm kind of saying he shouldn't, but there's a possibility he still might, okay? So if a doctor said, you know, you mustn't smoke, it's bad for your health, he's giving you advice. If I said he can't play soccer, it means that he little, literally can't. Maybe he can't run. Um, so it, it, they do have slightly different meanings. If a doctor says um, smoking is bad for you, so you can't smoke, that doesn't mean the same as the doctor saying you mustn't smoke. If the doctor says you can't smoke, He's saying you have to quit today. You have no choice. If he says you mustn't smoke, you can still decide if you want to quit or not. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Man, Deep is saying, Hi, Teacher Bob. Please give your phone number in the comments. We're, I'm not giving my phone number in the comments. Do you know how many phone calls I would get? That would just be crazy. Uh, I should back up and say hi to Madi. Good to see a familiar face in the chat as well. Hi, Madi. Hope you're having a good day. Um, and then I see Judith is in the chat as well. That was a good, thanks for the new information on fear of ferns, Judith. That was cool. Um, let me make a small adjustment here to how I'm doing this. 
we're going to move into members only chat mode for a sec. So while I'm doing that, we'll go to the river view. So members only chat mode, people who have clicked the join button below and who have decided to support my channel during my live English lessons, they get to um, ask questions directly uh, in the chat uh, for about 10 minutes. So we're going into members only chat mode now. Um, I will use my secret weapon during members only chat mode, which is my glasses. Uh, and I'll leave it on river cam while we're doing members only chat mode. So if you are a member and if you have a question, go ahead and ask it in the chat. Um, I will also pull up a question on the screen for a moment. And once the member only questions come in, I'll start answering them. I can says how to move language studying in a non English speaking country to live in an English speaking country. What are the difficulties you're going to face you that are going to face you and how to avoid them. So I made some corrections as I read that. Um, so one thing is if you are a student, this is much easier. So if you are of like high school age or you are a university age student, it will be a lot easier to move to an English speaking country. The challenge that will happen if you're older is it might be hard to obtain a work permit or it might be hard to immigrate to that country. So if you're a student, if you wanted to come to Canada, for instance, just search Google for how to how to study English in Canada as a university student and you'll find lots of info. Modags, hi, Mr. Bob. Every time you say members only chat mode, I hear it. Members only chat mode. <laughs> yeah, I guess that is how I pronounce your name, isn't it? Lolly had her message retracted, so I'm not sure what happened. Uh, Moto Explorer says, hello, teacher Bob. Could you tell me the difference between take and grab? So when you take something, like I'm going to take a banana when I leave for work tomorrow. I don't work tomorrow, but it's just an example. I'm going to grab a banana when I go to work tomorrow. So they can mean the same thing. Um, in the morning, I like to make sure that I uh, take my laptop when I head out the door. I want to make sure I grab my laptop when I head out the door. So they can mean the same thing. But technically, when you take something, uh, it means that you have it with you. Okay. I take my lunch to work. I take my laptop to work. Grab its technical meaning and the one we use it the most for is when you do this like i'm going to grab my water bottle i'm going to grab it it's the physical act of doing hopefully that didn't weird you guys out the physical act of holding going and grabbing something i define grab by saying grab that's how my definitions work sometimes let's see lolly says hello bob hello lolly bonjour mode says i'm definitely changing my name i need to think of a good stage name yes uh, Maria C. Hi, Bob. How are you? This is a bit difficult to explain orally, but I always wonder if you write a comma before the linker and comma, and I have doubts with the use of commas in English. So I do, but technically you don't have to. So if I said today I ate a banana, a bowl of cereal, and an apple, I would put a comma after cereal. And I think technically you're not supposed to, uh, but I do. So uh, I'm probably a bad person to ask. And then commas are a challenge for even English speakers. I know sometimes I use them very liberally and maybe in the wrong way, but technically it would take a long time to explain the use of commas. Hopefully you can do a search and find some information that will help you. I'll, I'll try to do that too. Okay. Lots of questions. Um, Betty. Hello, cutest Bob. Could you explain what's the meaning of studious? Would you mind showing the usage of it? Thank you for your remarkable work. Stay hydrated. My students, I'll stay hydrated. I'll have a drink right now. My students are very studious. I teach classes that are not required. I teach classes that students choose to take and the students who take my classes study very hard. They are very studious. So there you go. And yes, I will stay hydrated. Uh, let's see. Today, new COVID cases confirmed in Ontario, 179. Current hospitals, 165. Vaccination rate, 78% of the people have one and 51% of people 12 and older have both vaccines. Thanks, Eugene. So things are going in the right direction in Ontario, Canada. I hope that the rest of the world uh, has the same news uh, going over the next uh, over the next two months. 
Mode eggs. And yeah, Judah was asking in the chat about the difference between countable and uncountable nouns. Yeah, that's a whole lesson on its own, I think. I think I'll try and do a lesson on countable and uncountable nouns at some point uh, in the future. Is my camera still in focus? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, let's see here. Um, Brett says, hello, red light. Uh, thanks, Brett. Norma says, hello, Bob. It's so difficult for me to understand BBC News, although I studied in a British institute. I can follow American news much easier. So here's the difference, and hopefully um, I don't offend anyone. British news tends to be a little more intellectual um, than Canadian or American news. So Canadian and American news, it's very straightforward. They give you the facts and they show you a lot of images while they're telling the news story. When I watch BBC News, it's very, it's a more difficult kind of English. They show less pictures while they're talking. So I think North American uh, news is actually easier to understand. I've noticed that quite a bit. Um, the British news is a little more hoity-toity, I guess is the word. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. Uh, let's see here. So Norma, I, I totally get it. It, that that totally uh, is understandable. Anya, hi, teacher Bob. Has anyone in your family ever swam in that river? So you can kind of see it's not as bad today, but the river has a lot of algae in it right now, and it's a very muddy river. So although people do fish in it, people rarely swim in it. It's not a very nice river to swim in. Hey, for those of you that are wondering what's happening, I'm answering questions directly from the chat right now from members. Uh, if you're new here, if you're one of the 464 people watching, you should click this red subscribe button. I guarantee you will be happy. And if you're not, you can just unsubscribe later. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Maria C. Yeah, I think the use of commas is controversial in all languages. I think it is. It's a little tricky. Samuel Chen. Hi, teacher Bob. When is the usual vacation time in Canada? Some colleagues in Europe have their vacation this month. So for teachers and students, vacation is right now during the months of July and August. For everyone else in Canada, they usually have a week off at Christmas and then they take between two weeks a year and maybe four or five weeks a year of vacation whenever they want. They kind of book it at work. They say, oh, I want to go camping in September and they'll take time off from work and go camping. Uh, Fuang says, hello, teacher Bob. Could you explain how to use yet? Thank you. Um, well, that's a little more than I can explain now, but I'll give you some example sentences. Um, I haven't yet made a video about yet. I should do that. That was your first example sentence. Um, or I could say this, uh, if someone said, have you ever jumped out of a plane? I could say, I haven't done that yet. Although this past week I jumped out of my van and I pretended I was jumping out of a plane. Uh, Eugene says, we're going into step three roadmap to reopen on Friday, July 16th. We have lots of things to do this summer. Yes. So Ontario is going into the third step of reopening next Friday. Mode says, Mr. Bob, does the concept of human robot duality apply to the new moderators? No, they are actual people. So generally, if you're wondering who the moderators are, I will not reveal their identities but they are people who usually I've taught in the past and then they come and work for me as moderators. They're also usually people who are exceptionally good at reading chat really quickly and reacting to it. Uh, Moto Explorer says, how to understand poetic songs. I really like The Doors, but I can't get everything. Moto Explorer, neither can I. Um, the Doors write some very, very interesting lyrics, very challenging uh, to totally understand. Sorry, I'm just looking at my camera. It, it has this interesting way of focusing where it finds my eye. But when I put my glasses on, it can't find it. Uh, Maria C. I agree, Norma, and the intonation is different too. Yes. Norma says, thank you, Bob. No problem. Madi. Hello, Bob. I'm glad to see you happy. I'm busy these days, but I usually watch the short videos. Yeah, good to see you, Madi. I know you're kind of in and out sometimes. Totally understandable. Um, thanks for popping in, though, and saying hi. Uh, Natalia says, hello, everyone. Hi, Natalia. Mode eggs. Maria C. Yes, I agree. One of the trickiest punctuation marks to use. Yes, the comma. Very tricky. Amal says, could you explain the difference between go back, come back, and get back? If I'm at my friend's house, when I'm done visiting, I will go back home. Okay? So that's how I would use go back. 
Um, a few days later, I might come back to his house to get something, but I could also say I might go back to his house to get something. Depends on how I'm talking about it. I see how this gets tricky. And I might go there to get back something that I lent him. So I'm all a few example sentences, but maybe not a lot of clarity from me on those. Betty Lou, hi again, teacher Bob. I love your explanation when it comes to grammar. Could you make more videos about it? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So I started making videos on verb tenses and I got through most of the present tense and I do plan to start on the future and the past tense during the summer. Just, I keep having ideas that are more fun. In fact, next Tuesday's video, I, I have a, I, I don't want to share too much. I have to um, figure out if it works yet, but I think next Tuesday's video is going to be really fun and it, it won't be about grammar, but I'll get to it. I'll get to the grammar lessons at some point. Uh, let's see. Maria C. I've watched YouTube videos from comedians that say if you learn English from the BBC, it's dangerous because you may end up speaking like them and depending on the context, you may sound awkward. Yeah, that's hard to say. Um, I watch BBC News quite often. Um, it's on at 7 p.m. here, uh, BBC World News Tonight. And uh, it it's very, th their accent sounds very cool. I like it. It's a very cool accent. Um, let's see here. Mode eggs. Yesterday I watched the highlights of England versus Denmark. I could barely understand the British commentator without subtitles. And not knowing the players' names made it even more difficult. Yeah, sometimes when I watch hockey in French, so I know you're watching soccer in English, sometimes I'll actually read over the list of player names a bunch of times before I watch the game because sometimes the player names sound like words in French, like Dubois or Le Mieux, like those actually sound like French words. So that's, that's always a good strategy mode. Read over the player roster, at least the starting lineup. Madi, calling it a night, will you say this when you are about to wrap up this lesson or it's slang? Yes, if you're calling it a night, it means you are heading off to sleep. So have a good night, Madi. Uh, mode eggs. Hoity toity and honky dory are two of my favorite phrases in English. Um, well, maybe you'll like this one too. Sometimes people say hokey doodles when they're surprised. That's kind of a weird older term. I haven't heard it in a long time, but I think I heard one of my kids say it the other day. My brother used to say that when I was a kid, when he saw something really cool, he would say, hokey doodles, look at that. Hey, I'm switching back to uh, the river camp for a sec. I'm going to do an audio check and then I'm going to get back to There we go. Um, and I'm going to get the next question up on the screen. In a moment, I don't need my, my secret glasses because on my screen, the questions are really big, but when I go to members only, I need to, uh, I need to have a look. So let me get to questions outside and let me get to the next question. And I do want to say hi to Sean from free 99 English who just popped into the chat. Um, I'm always happy when other English teachers hang out in the chat because it's kind of helpful for you, right? Uh, if you have a question and I don't answer it, sometimes they will. Uh, sometimes it's fun to just know you're having a conversation with them. But if you don't remember Sean, uh, Sean pops in every once in a while. Uh, Sean used to be here quite a bit uh, a year ago. Um, good to see you, Sean. Uh, let's get to Ruslan's question. Hello, teacher Bob. Is it allowed to grow vegetables in your backyard in Canada? Why it's not so popular like in Russia? You are totally allowed to grow vegetables. You are allowed to have a vegetable garden. You are allowed to grow vegetables in your backyard. I think a lot of people don't do it because it's too hard. They don't like weeds and they don't like weeding. My personal opinion is the world would be a better place if everyone had a little vegetable garden and a little flower garden. Because I think when you get in the dirt, uh, it's good for your brain. It's good for your soul, I think. Let's see here. James Anderson has the next question. Hello, Teacher Bob. Please, is there a special secret that you can give us? A special tip to improve our retention of information. Use it right away. Okay. And use it multiple times. So when you learn the English word for dog, draw a little picture of a dog and write dog underneath. I know you all know the word for dog. It's just an example. And then immediately in the next email you send in English, use the word dog. The next English conversation you have, try to make sure you use the word dog in that conversation. If you can learn something and then use it right away, it's very, very helpful. You will remember it. Um, way better. That's probably the best advice that I can give, uh, James. Um, 
Lolly Lolly said, oh, Lolly or Mode? What means very in this expression at that very moment? It's a way to emphasize. Um, it just means, yeah, you know how English, sometimes we like to emphasize certain parts of the sentence to make it sound more forceful. So if you said at that moment, he appeared, that sounds cool. But if you say at that very moment, he appeared, it's a little more emphatic. So, and I would say this time, uh, je dois deviner, je pense que c'est lolly this time. I think it's lolly this time. That's my guess. Let me know in the chat if I was right or wrong. Um, next question from Chinglin. It's hard for me to pronounce English names, the English names. How can I solve this problem? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Like names like Bob are pretty easy. Names like John are pretty easy. Although that H doesn't really do anything in John, does it? Um, I think you just have to practice them. Uh, especially if you work with people who speak English, uh, it's good to learn how to pronounce their names properly. Uh, let's see here. Mode Eggs says, Lolly Lolly, no, sorry, I ruined it by asking a question. Oh, c'était Mode qui a posé la question? Was it Mode that asked the question? That's what I'm trying to uh, deviner. I'm trying to decide. Uh, let me get to the next question. Um, Ario says, Hola, Mr. Robert, how are you? I asked Mr. Brent, that's American English with this guy. That's his channel. His name is Brent. To make a video on Canadian culture, it would be great, right? It would be great. That'd be cool if Brent did a video on Canadian culture. Although there's not a whole lot of differences between the two. There's some. Uh, let's see here. Jofi has the next question. I'm just trying to... Oh, Lolly says, yes, Bob, bingo. Thanks for your answer. Oh, c'était Lolly qui a posé la question. It was Lolly who asked the question. <laughs> I think I guessed right. Uh, Jofi, what verb... What's the verb used for plucking coconut from its tree? What is the accurate word for coconut tree leaf? I don't know. We would probably say coconut leaf. And we would probably say picking. You would probably pick coconuts from a coconut tree. I have to admit, though... We don't have coconut trees here and I have never picked a coconut, but when we pick an apple or pick a peach or pick fruit from a tree, we use the verb to pick. Um, let's see here. Um, Nikki says, hi, Bob, what is the meaning of unsolicited? So in Canada, if someone phones you and tries to sell you something, we say it's an unsolicited phone call. It means that you didn't ask them to call you. They called you out of the blue. That's another phrase. They just decided to call you. And we would say that that's an unsolicited phone call. And technically it's called telemarketing and it's not legal in Canada, but it happens all the time. <laughs> I get a lot of unsolicited phone calls at my house. I get a lot of telemarketers calling me. Next question from Salah. Sala says, thank you, teacher Bob. I want a poem suitable for beginners that I can memorize to support my vocabulary. Well, I'm not sure I can write a poem, but I might be able to find one. But Sala, can you leave a comment asking that same question? And I'll, I'll see what I can do. I don't have a lot of time to write a poem, but it's definitely a good strategy. Poetry, music, like learning a song about vocabulary or um, learning a poem about vocabulary can be very, very helpful. Uh, let's see here. Um, next question from Lena. I'm getting distracted by the chat. Uh, Lena, hi, Bob. How do you pronounce drought in Canada? I think I heard a Canadian pronounce it differently. We say drought. Currently, we are not having a drought here. Currently, there is lots of water. You can see that my lawn is very green. It rains quite often. I was actually worried it might rain today and we wouldn't be able to do this outside. So we are not having a drought in my part of Canada. Uh, let's see here. Salas says, hello, Bob, how are you? What is the difference between see, watch, look, say, speak, tell, talk, hear, listen, remember, and remind? Okay, I'll use all of these in, a, in an example sentence and hopefully that helps a bit, but it would take quite a while to explain them all. So right now I see the river, okay? I can see the river behind me. Oh, I got to go back to the questions. Um, sometimes I sit and watch the water. So notice I see the river, but if, if you watch something, it's like you're deciding to do it, okay? 
When I walk through a room, I see the TV, but if I sit down, I watch the TV. I've decided to do it. Um, and then sometimes I look at someone. So that's deciding to, um, yeah, just trying to think of an example. Like I was at the mall yesterday for the first time in 16 months. And it was fun to just kind of look at people walking around. It was fun to watch people. So I'm not doing a great job of explaining look and watch. I think you should look that one up and get a better explanation. When you say something, it means that you, it comes out of your mouth. I like to say a lot of words. When you speak, you're intentionally saying things. When you tell a story, you're giving, you're telling the story to someone. I'm not doing a good job of explaining this. And when you talk, it's the action of having a conversation. Hear and listen is a little bit easier. Listening is what you decide to do. I like to listen to music. I like to listen to the birds. You are deciding to do that action. When you hear something, the sound comes to you, okay? Um, so there's a little bit of a difference. And remember and remind when you remember something, um, it's something that maybe you forgot and now you've thought of it again. But when you remind someone of something, you're telling them not to forget. Later today, Jen will remind me to go and get some groceries this afternoon. I don't think I did a great job, Salah, of explaining those, but they're a little tricky. Uh, they're very nuanced. I should do an entire lesson on all of those. That would be good. Uh, let's see here. Jamie, have you used Hello Talk? It's a language exchange app and someone thinks it might spoil language skills because users are native, but not professional at teaching. What do you think? I think all intentional practice is valuable. I think anytime you can have an English conversation, whether you're having that conversation with another beginner or whether you're having that conversation with an English teacher, um, I think it's all valuable. It shows that you're motivated and you have an intention of learning English. Um, some people like to say certain things are bad and certain things are good, but I just think do everything you can to learn English. Don't think of things as good or bad. Instead, think of it as what am I getting out of this? If you can have a conversation on Hello Talk and it forces you to think in English and form words and have a conversation, then do it. Why? Sometimes people, I think, get too worried about what is the right way. Um, the wrong way is to do nothing. The right way is to do lots of different things. That is my opinion. A lovely tiger. Where? Oh, sorry. No, a lovely tiger. Hi, teacher Bob. Nice to meet you here. I have a question to ask. On the internet, why don't you use in the internet? It's always been on the internet. I found that on the internet. I'm going to put my videos on the internet. I'm going to upload this video onto the internet. Um, we've just never used in. I'm not sure why. It's always been on. Luciano, can you explain the difference between lend and borrow? If you wanted this water bottle, Luciano, I could lend it to you. Okay, I own it you want it, I could lend it to you. If you had this water bottle, I could borrow it from you, okay? So it's simply a difference in direction. When you are the person who owns something and you let someone else use it for a while, you are lending it to them. If you switch roles, if you know someone that has something nice and you want to use it, you would borrow it from them. There, I think I finally explained something in a very clear way today. Sorry for all of the other not so good explanations, but I think that one was a pretty good explanation. <laughs> um, as I'm saying that, I should say hi to the 482 people watching. Uh, if you are new here, don't forget to click this red subscribe button here um, to get notified when I do new videos. Uh, Riksan, what is the difference between start and start off? When should I use the second one? Um, yeah, let me start off by saying that that's a great question. Let me start by saying that's a great question. Um, sometimes I like to start off my day with a cup of coffee. Sometimes I like to start my day with a cup of coffee. I really think the off is unnecessary and probably just used for emphasis or to sound a little more colorful when you're talking. Um, I like to start off my live streams by saying hi to everyone. I like to start my live streams by saying hi to everyone. Both, all those sentences are correct, for sure. Um, this just takes practice, Hong. Hi, Bob. I'm from Vietnam. I have a question for you. How can I say a long sentence in English? Thanks. So, first of all, practice it. 
If you're asking how to form sentences that are very long, a simple technique is to form a compound sentence. So add the word and, and then another part, or but, and another part. You know, I like to go shopping and I like to go fishing. That doesn't really make sense, but it's, it's a complete sentence. Um, I like to go to the store, but sometimes it's too busy. So try to make sentences that are called compound sentences, where it's really two sentences put together with and or but. Um, I hope that answered your question. Semra. Hi, Semra. Hi, Bob. Hope you're well. I have no internet. Oh, no. I watch you for a while. See you next week. Have a nice Sunday. Yes, thanks, Semra. Yeah, um, I'm glad my internet's working. The internet at my house actually stopped working a couple times this week, but not during my live streams. So that was a good thing. Uh, let me see here. Charles, how to improve my speaking with idioms in a short time? Well, first of all, if you're looking to improve your speaking, I wouldn't work on idioms. I would probably study phrasal verbs instead. Phrasal verbs are very, very common in English, but you can get away with not using too many idioms. You might, you might want to know idioms so you can understand an English speaker, but there's no requirement that you use a lot of idioms. Phrasal verbs, though, we use all the time. I probably just used a bunch of phrasal verbs during the last hour of this lesson. So I would say this, study phrasal verbs. That would be my uh, recommend, recommendation to you. Let's see here. Um, Clover says, your background is real or a picture? It's definitely real. That is a real background. In fact, I'll show you it's a real background. There, I thought that would, uh, whew, just a little run and I'm a tiny bit out of breath. So yes, it's definitely a, a real background. Um, as you can see, I did not run in front of a large painting. Uh, I just ran out. Hopefully you saw me waving. <laughs> Everyone in the chat is laughing. Yeah, it's not fake. It's def definitely a real background. I see Vito laughing. Uh, I see talk Italian with a Rode is laughing, Eduardo, Martin, Hassan, Lolly, Lolly. Yes, definitely not a fake background. Okay, let me go to the next question here. Yeah, this is a little tricky too. This is from Juliana. In which cases may we omit articles? A little fix there before nouns. Are the articles a and an similar in their specifying purpose to the article the? So this is a long lesson as well. Um, I think there are a lot of YouTube teachers who have taught this, um, but definitely we have definite articles and indefinite. So it's the dog or a dog. And one is talking about a specific dog, okay? And one is referring to a non-specific dog. I can't explain all of the intricacies of this here. Um, it's a little bit tricky for me to do that. So, sorry, Juliana, I'm going to just leave that one. And hopefully, this bug followed me back from my little run. Uh, hopefully, you can find a good explanation of it because it's a pretty complex topic. Because um, I would say things like, um, this is a bottle of water. The bottle of water that I brought out with me is very cold. Okay, so you see how I went from like using ah because it's a general description to being very specific. Um, but even that's not a great description. Uh, next question. There's actually, I just heard a weird sound. I don't know if there's an animal behind me. We'll see. There are no bears in this part of Canada. Yusuf says, hello, Bob. Tell me the difference between Canadian English and American English. Well, maybe Dave can go and find my video. I just did a video two weeks ago about American or Canadian English compared mostly to American English. And that, Yusuf, would probably give you the best explanation of what the difference is. Short answer, they're not very different at all. I have a slight accent when I go to America, uh, but we have no problem understanding each other. And there's a few little words that we use uh, differently. Uh, Mode Eggs is asking if there's caterpillars. No, I think they have all turned into moths now, Mode Eggs. I think that we have passed the caterpillar season. I don't have to sit with my feet in a box anymore. Uh, let's see here. Veshu says, um, 
Thanks, Dave, for sharing that. Hey, it's almost time to wrap this up, but there's only eight questions left, so I'm going to finish them. Please, if you ask a question after this point in the video, I will not be answering it. But I have nine, eight or nine to go. I'm trying to, I'm going to try and get through all of them. So hopefully Dave and Brad can stick around. Uh, if you have to go, Dave or Brad, that's no problem. Vishu, hey, Bob, I'm learning to speak English, but I'm struggling to speak. I know English, but the word's not coming to my mind quickly. So first of all, make sure you're having structured English conversations once a week with someone. Maybe go to Preply or another website and hire someone. Number two memorize some things that you will commonly be saying when you go and have an English conversation, no, be able to talk about the weather, be able to talk about the football game that's happening tomorrow or the one that you just watched. Make sure you memorize in advance a few useful phrases that you can easily use. Also, when you're having an English conversation, um, just try to slow down a little bit. The person you're talking to isn't going to be that worried if you speak to uh, a little bit more slowly. Sarala, Mr. Bob, how can I improve academic writing? Again, hire someone who can help you. I know not all of you can just go out and hire a tutor, but there's two areas when you are learning English where having a speaking partner or a writing writing partner are quite helpful. Uh, so that would be, would be the best. Maybe go again to preply.com. There's a link below and find someone who will help you with your English writing because you want someone who will correct your writing and give you feedback on it. Let's see here. Let's see, Ji Hao from China. Hello, Bob, I can't understand English in CNC or BBC or other news show. Do you have some advice for us to understand English in the news? They speak fast and use many words. Number one, watch a news story in your own language and then see if you can find the same news story in English. Number two, read a news story in your own language and then read that news story in English and then watch that news story in English. So use your own language as kind of a guide into the English news story uh, and try to do, you can do that on YouTube. You can do that on a lot of video platforms, but certainly watching and reading the news in your own language and then reading and watching it in English can be very, very helpful. Uh, let's see here. Min. Hello, dear teacher Bob. It's the first time for me to ask a question. What do you, do you have any suggestions about teaching students when they are from quite different levels? So I have not had this problem, so I don't have any really good advice. Um, for me, I teach students who are all the same age and they're pretty much all at the same level. So I don't have a lot of experience with that Min except that I would do testing at the beginning of the class for the first few days to determine what levels they're at. So I had a really good idea and then maybe try to help them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Eva Chen, hi Bob. In yesterday's lesson, you used down pat to describe something that you want to do well. Can you give me another example of using this phrase? Thank you. So um, there's a few things that I have down pat. I set all my equipment up and I take it all down every Saturday, I have it down pat. It means I've learned to do it, I have a certain way of doing it, and it goes really smoothly. Um, going to the grocery store and getting groceries during COVID, I have it down pat now. I have my mask, I go in the store, I get my cart, I, I do it quickly and smoothly. I have it down pat. Let's see here. So Lee. When I hang out with a group of native speaking colleagues, I get lost easily. I'm a little bit frustrated. How can I improve my listening? Well, you're in a perfect situation to improve your listening. First of all, you have a group of native English speaking colleagues. I would just say, try to hang out with them in smaller groups and slowly increase the group size. See if you can go and have coffee with just two of them and do that for a few weeks and then maybe start to do more things when there's a larger group. Um, and I would just try to socialize with them as much as you possibly can. Um, Dimitri, honestly, I'm not sure what's happening. It's like, I feel like I'm in a kind of a horror movie here. There's like something, something in the tree behind me way over there. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just some people in a canoe and I missed them. 
What is the best way to learn and remembering phrasal verbs, collocations, and idioms? So I think, again, the best way to learn these things is to use them a lot immediately after you learn them and several times. So if you do speak with someone in English once a week, write down the new phrasal verbs you've learned, write down the new idioms and collocate, and then try to use them. Um, using them is just the best way to remember them. And if you can use them two or three times over a two or three period, day period, um, it's very, very helpful. Uh, let me just check where I'm at on the questions. So I mentioned, I think after a certain point, yes, I'm going to do this as the last question. So I think Marcos from Brazil gets the last question here. Uh, just let me check something for a sec. Sorry, I'm just checking my audio for a minute. Okay, last question from Marcos. Good afternoon, Bob. Do you fish in the river behind you? What fish are found in it? Hugs. So the river behind me has a lot of carp. It has smallmouth bass, but not a lot. Uh, and it has a lot of catfish. I think those are probably the three main fish. I do not fish in that river very much. By the way, I've discovered what the sound is. Uh, it's actually our goats. Our goats are in the field behind me. Uh, over the hill um, and they're eating. I think they're eating leaves off the tree. So it's not a bear. Um, anyways, back to the question. Um, what fish are found in? Yeah, I know when I was a kid, I caught a carp with a net and I know when my brother fished in the river, he would catch catfish. So not the tastiest fish. And we uh, generally don't eat fish from that river because the river is not the cleanest river. If you watched my other channel, you'll see, uh, you'll get a closer view of the river. It's a little bit, uh, scummy right now a lot of algae in it anyways let's go to this view let me uh just say uh thank you all for hanging out with me for an hour and a bit i got through almost all the questions there's a few more but i did want to cut it off at a certain point i don't want to talk too long every week i have to save my voice for making a video on tuesday anyways thanks for watching i uh, do remember if there were parts of this lesson that you didn't understand do come back in a day or so and turn on the automatic subtitles and watch that little portion again. It can be quite helpful. Uh, I do want to say thanks to Dave and to Brad for helping out. Thanks for being here, guys. That was very nice of you. Uh, and I do want to say bye to some specific people, to Wanda, Prado, Mode Eggs. Martin is saying bye. Anuat is saying bye. Lolly Lolly is saying bye. Um, Amina Ali, say I'm saying bye to you as well. Um, let's see here. Clover, hopefully, I liked, was Clover the one that asked me to, if this was a, a real was real behind me that was kind of fun um for all of you from italy i will try to watch part of the game i think it's on sunday afternoon here i think it's on sunday night and of course um i will be cheering for italy um what's the point of cheering for a country that already speaks english i should cheer for the country where i have the most viewers in so people in england don't watch my videos people in italy do um, i'm just checking what time the game is maybe someone in the chat can tell me it says they are playing tomorrow at 3 p.m. my time. So I'm going to try and sit down. I'm going to cheer for Italy. It doesn't mean that I don't like all of the other European teams that are out. It just means that if I have to choose between England and Italy, I'm going to cheer for Italy. Because when I look at my YouTube stats, far more people in Italy watch my channel. So I'm going to cheer for the Italian team. So anyways... Thanks for watching, everybody. I think I've talked long enough. I'm going to click the end button. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Um, and I'll see you Tuesday with another little English lesson. Bye. We'll go back to this view for this last couple seconds. Just, just in case a goat comes out of the field and tries to attack me. That doesn't happen, by the way. But that would be funny, wouldn't it? I think that would make that would make my live stream a lot more popular if I was attacked by a goat. Anyways, bye.